So we're going to get started. Um, thanks everybody for quieting down. Uh, my name is Chris Gorman. I co-chair Spectrum here at the museum. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, I know it's very cold out there, so thanks for braving the cold. Thanks to you all, it's nice and warm in here. Um, we have a great program, we have a great panel. I um, just wanted to tell you, uh, Spectrum's been around now, we're into our fifth year here at the museum. Um, I see some familiar faces out there, so thank you all for your continued support. If this happens to be your first Spectrum event, thank you for trying it out. I hope you'll come back for future events. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're doing our annual trivia night. We host every year with Art 21. Uh, it's called, Are You Smarter Than a Curator? And if you think you are, you should come out. And if you're not sure, you should come out anyway. Think about purchasing a ticket. Um, if anybody's posting on social media tonight, uh, we'd encourage you to use the hashtag MetSpectrum. Um, we're going to be taking some questions from Twitter, but we're also going to be taking some questions from you all as well. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our moderator um, and my fellow co-chair for Spectrum, Lucy Rodolia. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I am Lucy Rodolia, and I work in the digital media department here at the Met. I'd like to introduce our fellow, my fellow, fellow panelists, or the panelists that I will be conversing with this evening. Um, first is director of the New Museum's Incubator for Art, Technology, and Design, Julia Kagansky. And then we have our three artists. We have uh, Clement Bala, who is associate professor of graphic design at Rhode Island School of Design, and also a digital artist. post-conceptual artist based in Brooklyn whose digital um, media is, is seen at the Whitney and at the Metropolitan Museum. That's Corey Archangel. I had one card stuck to the other one, but <laughs> Corey Archangel is the gentleman there on the right, on my right. We also have Carla Gannis there in this sandwiched in between the two artists. She's another artist and assistant chair of digital art at Pratt Institute. Um, again, that's Carla Gannis. And then finally, we have assist, associate curator in the Department of Photographs at the Metropolitan Museum, Mia Feynman. <laughs> so thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm sorry I botched the introduction slightly. <laughs> but let's get the conversation started. Um, we're going to be talking about the digital art uh, evolution of the technology and the medium as, as far as how it pertains to uh, the wider scope of art history. Um, these days. So um, what I first wanted to talk to you all about is kind of throwing ideas out there to, to tell everybody what is digital art? Where does digital art land in the scope of the medium now? What, what does it touch on in contemporary art today? So I hope that somebody can um, jump in with their thoughts on that. Um, Okay, I'll start. <laughs> wow, there was pressure. It's like we were all looking at each other. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think it's evolving and changing, and of course we would understand that because of the nature of the media itself, correct? Um, earlier, I think several new media artists, and I think they still kind of um, <sighs> had this taxonomy, taxonomy for digital art that it's something that's software-based, for example or um, that the medium is digital. So like sculpture or, or digital print work wouldn't really be considered truly digital art. Although I think that that's changing now and we have net art, we also are kind of post internet, so several people you know, um, claim. And, and so now I think that there's a broader definition of what digital art can encompass. And for example, I have a friend who does life tracking and she tracks using all of these different technologies or applications. However, then the work that is an outcome of that is actually analog. And um, I still feel like because of the concepts that drive her work that it's digital art. So. Um, as with most terms <laughs> in this field, um, it's kind of imperfect and problematic, but we all can't seem to agree on a better one. So. Digital art is one that I find myself using a lot. And to me, the reason that I use it or the times that I use it is to describe work that um, uses digital technologies in some significant way in the production or the dissemination or the presentation of the work. 
Um, and increasingly, I feel like that is becoming a more problematic definition because more and more people are using digital technology. Um, and you know, now I find myself contending with, you know, somebody's using um, Photoshop to you know completely alter an image. Would I call that digital art? I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's it's fraught with all kinds of conflicts. Yeah, I think that maybe as time goes on, that kind of term will dissipate in a weird way. Just like, like TV or something. It's like a little doesn't really make any sense anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. TV doesn't make sense. Well, like TV, like there is really no like television isn't is kind of splintering. Like I don't really wa I like watch a ton of television, but it might not actually be on my television. Right. You know. Right, a lot of people don't even have cable and they just stream things from several internet apps. So I see where you're going with that. Um, all right, well, I think we'll transition to the first question on the list. Um, Mia, this one's for you. It's um, regarding the Mets collection, um, what exhibitions and areas of the collection are related to digital art? What have we done in the past? Uh, well, the Met has been taking baby steps in the direction of digital art. Uh, the two departments that uh, are most actively involved in uh, collecting and creating exhibitions in, uh, with this kind of work are uh, the Modern and Contemporary Art Department and uh, the Department of Photographs. Um, I'm in photographs and that's really the perspective that I'm looking at this work from. Um, uh, we did an exhibition in 2007 called Closed Circuit uh, that presented some uh, acquisitions of uh, video and new media art that we had been making over the past uh, you know, decade or so. Um, and uh, at, in 2012, um, I did a show uh, called After Photoshop, uh, which is uh, manipulated photography in the digital age. And that was the sort of uh, afterward to, to a, a larger show I did called Faking It, uh, which was on manipulated ph photography before Photoshop. Um, and so um, that, uh, those are the two exhibitions that we've done that have really dealt with that. Um, on the screen are a few uh, works in the collection that I would consider digital art. Uh, this is, these are 3D uh, prints um, of uh, uh, scans of people, their, their portraits, um, that are uh, then printed uh, in uh, three dimensions at a one to 10 scale. Um, let's, uh, can I just uh, sure. forward to the next one? This is, um, uh, this is a work by Jim Campbell uh, that is um, you know, shown on, uh, created on an LED uh, uh, monitor uh, using um, you know, video images of people walking. Um, this, is, it's just a, this is just a still. Um, this is a work, uh, work by uh, Wolfgang Stähler, um, who was a you know early sort of pioneer of internet art, um, and it's a v uh, well, it was originally a real time uh, view of uh, the Hudson River Valley um, uh, that was conveyed over the internet, kind of one uh, image uh, updated, you know, every every few seconds. Um, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, this is a work, a digitally manipulated work. Uh, it's a it's a film uh, by Maria Marshall um, of her little boy uh, who appears to be smoking a cigarette. Um, she used um, a Hollywood uh, special effects software uh, to create this effect. Um, this was, uh, and this is a work by uh, Juan von Cuberta, um, a Spanish artist um, who uh, did a Google image search for uh, the word photo. Um, and then ran all those images through a photo mosaic uh, shareware program uh, to create uh, an image of the first photograph uh, from 1826 uh, by uh, Niepce, one of the inventors of photography. Um, so you know, it's a work that's using the most uh, up-to-date technology to look at the very origins of photography. Um, and then these are just some, uh, uh, this is a group of uh, images by uh, Wolfgang Tillmans. Uh, he, uh, these are 
like most photographs, uh, you know, uh, they're born digital. You know, he used a digital camera to create the uh, photographs. Um, and then when he shows his work, usually the, the prints are pinned to the walls um, and then destroyed after the exhibition. Um, and so um, as, a, as a backup uh, for these prints, uh, we actually have a, a disk of digital files. Um, that can be used to generate new prints, and and, um, and you know this is just the this is the only work in the collection for which we have the digital files as part of the collection, and you know it's a kind of just a hint of where things might be going, could be going in the future in terms of collecting photography when you're dealing with images that are born digital when you have the digital file, and in a sense, you have the original, if there is such a thing. Absolutely. Um, that's really interesting. It looks like several of the works in our collection currently are photography-based, so that's definitely Maria's, uh, Mia's expertise. Um, I think next we're going to talk about the art historical context of digital art, and um, I wanted to turn it over to Corey. Um, Corey, how does your work and digital art in general relate to the subjects and ideas that have pervaded throughout art history? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, maybe I could say something-ish to that. Um, uh, I, I would... I don't know if I see so much of a dividing line between digital and, and, and pre-digital, right? And so, um, uh, so, you know, we're like surrounded by different types of technology, right? And uh, an example I always like to use is the piano. You know, like at a certain point, the piano, or the piano forte, was like a slamming, like the slamming new thing, right? Uh, and and you know all the composers wanted to compose on it, and you know, and and so like weird stuff like if you hear a, you know a Bach piece played on a piano, or a modern piano, it's like not even in the right tuning anymore. And so anyway, so culture is just like all these things keep happening, and so I would view what I do as in this longer lineage of just like work that dealt with the culture of the time and and the technology of the time. Does that? I hope I don't know. Is that okay? How's that? <laughs> that totally makes sense. Um, Carla, I also know that you've done work in the past that's referenced art history. And I specifically wanted to talk about the Garden of Emoji Delights. It was up at the Emoji Art Show at iBeam a couple months ago. And um, it's you can explain maybe better than I can how this is tied to art history. And <laughs> well. There's the obvious, Gee. yeah, um, appropriation of the Haramis Bosch um, Garden of Earthly Delights, and this is from the triptych, the third panel, which is the hellscape. And I had incorporated emoji into some of my works before, but not a work that was primarily or all emoji. And then a show that Julia co-curated um, arose in December, and I decided to produce this work and it was an emoji light bulb moment when I decided to overlay emoji onto the Bosch piece. And at first I was kind of questionable. I was like, can I do this? And <laughs> it was really interesting, the responses, because there were several articles written about it and quite a few people were vitriolic about this. They were like, how could you, you know, destroy a masterpiece? <laughs> and um, I, you know, I, I totally understand their point of view. Um, but for me, it seemed to kind of make sense to take these characters or these emoticons that we're so used to using in one context on a really beautifully designed, very clean, elegant, you know, device and to superimpose them over a classical painting and it resonates in a totally different way. And there are all different kind of subtexts to that. Mm -hmm. oh, it takes a second to click on. Um, Clement, I know you also have referenced art history in your work, and I'm scrolling over to a piece that is actually inspired by the Mets collection, or directly utilizing photographs of the Mets collection. So would you mind talking a little bit about your Iconoclashes series? Um, yeah, sure. Oh, is that on? Oh, now it's on. Yeah, um, and maybe I'll, I'll talk about it, and I'll jump back to the, to the first question at the same time, um, and, and maybe answer 
Corey and, and, and Mia. Uh, one of the things like, what, what is digital art or, or how do I see digital art? I mean, I, I agree, like I have huge problems with, with medium specificity, but I'm also invested in the idea that um, um, algorithms and sort of computation technology have sort of maybe uh, fundamentally changed um, a couple of things that we do with technology, themes like interactivity or, or, or generative or even <coughs> networked art. And so, whereas I do agree that digital art might disappear as, as a medium, I do think having some kind of medium specificity to, to bracket maybe a kind of conversation is really interesting. So if we take photo, for example, right? Photo is sort of bleeding into everything, but photo is a historical discourse still remains hugely important for a lot of artists working within that. And so um, I, you know, I would consider, or, or I see a lot of digital art um, that might not even be made digitally, but that addresses the kind of themes brought around by say network technologies or generative technologies. So, it, I mean, if we take this work, for example, okay, that was like a long winded way of saying, if we take this work, for example, it's, it's you know, it's almost just found, it's just appropriated. I really didn't do any programming. I really didn't do much to do it. What I did was I took the Photoshop, the standard Photoshop uh, image merge function that creates sort of panoramas. Everybody has them on their iPhone now. You kind of take a bunch of photos and it merges it into a panorama. And I just fed uh, images from the Met's website into that filter. Um, and the, 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 basically because I can't figure out how to make panoramas, it stacks all the images on top of one another and then tries to blend them together however it can, right? Um, so it, it's really a study into what, you know, what an algorithm uh, uh, sees, quote unquote, not to anthropomorphize an algorithm, in these images or how it makes sense of them and then how uh, we as viewers are then confronted with somehow trying to make sense of these images that, that really don't, don't make sense or might point to weird new meanings, so. Clement, I wanna, oh, let me turn this on. Something else though that I think is really fascinating about this is a lot of these artifacts weren't attributed to an author, they were attributed to a god. So, you know, they fell from the earth and likewise, the images that result from your merges are really attributed to a computer and a computer vision instead of to yourself. And I think that that's what really makes this project brilliant. So. <laughs> yeah, I think we've, we've just addressed art history and pop culture in a single question. So I think that was, that was really um, excellent. Clement, I'm going to go back to you again and ask you, um, to what extent does the device and or software influence the finished work? Um, and it, it's sort of related to your previous description of the fact that you had a hand in it, but you didn't really write any programming. And so you're sort of co-creating with this device and technology. So if you want to speak about that. For yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I think, you know, Corey said it really well, just like you are just working with the tools of the time, right? And so... Yeah, I see a lot of this or, or some of the other work that I do is, is um, just looking at the tools as, as they're given and, and maybe identifying, um, you know, seams or moments where the, the tools seem to be doing something slightly off or slightly strange and then um, just collecting those moments uh, and just to, to kind of um, take a look at, th they're kind of like a glimpse under the hood of the piano, right? Like if a string is broken on the piano, it sounds really weird and you'll notice the piano a lot more. Or if a hammer is broken, it's the classic example. It's like a prepared piano. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And so, so the tools, um, or hopefully, you know, as much as possible in my work, the, the tools completely determine the outcome. Like, I kind of have no idea what's going to happen a lot of the time. I don't set out with a form in mind. I set out looking at the tool, and hopefully the tool sort of generates the, the form as, as much as possible. And in general, in digital art, to all the panelists, do you see that happening? amongst your peers, amongst other creators, and in your own work? Um, do you see the technology sort of taking precedence over the artist's hand? Or how, how much do you manipulate the technology in order to create works? And then for Julia and Mia, what do you see in the realm of digital art that, um, that is being created as something that is very heavily based on the technology and the code? and um, I mean, something that comes to mind for me is glitch art, where it's a mistake, it's a happy accident that artists are uh, focusing on and using that in their work. So um, just to open it up to the panel to kind of talk about maybe a little bit more about how the technology has a role in the creation of um, these artworks. I was going to 
was going to mention something that has to do with Clement, and then I can talk about myself. But um, you know, in tr something that I think you've spoken about in terms of those Google Earth images is that it's not really a mistake; it's the computer's vision. And I mean, I think that's something interesting that we all should probably deliberate is that a computer sees in a different way, and so we ascribe based on our own vision, our own cones and retinas, right, ever, you know, oh, that's a mistake, but it's not really a mistake, you know, and, and so kind of exploring that territory, I think, is really fertile ground. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that you're talking about is uh, computational photography, which is something that I'm like super excited and <laughs> uh, thinking about, and Mia, I'm yeah. curious to hear if, if you're thinking about that too. Um, but to answer your question about the role of the technology, I think um, it's really amazing when uh, artists pick up on some of these things like the way that the computer sees and celebrate that and investigate uh, the, the art, uh, the beauty of failure like you find in glitches, right? Um, but I'm also really interested in how artists articulate their own vision within that. And I think sometimes, especially um, in more software-based practices, um, and you can sometimes get into this territory where people uh, privilege the technology and it's almost about like, oh, I'm gonna hack this latest uh, tool and get it to do something really cool and then I'm gonna publish that online and then I'm gonna move on. And it's more of this like demo culture and uh, Zach Lieberman, who I love his work very much, talks a lot about um, encouraging poems rather than demos. And that's a distinction that I think is really valuable in uh, thinking about the role the tools play in the creative process. To that point, did you say poems? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that's been a really interesting um, kind of endeavor. For me, recently I actually worked with a poet, which I think some of you know about this. Um, we worked on a project for a year where I was basically transcribing his words. And um, then it became a full-on transmedia or our publisher because we worked with a book publisher and also a gallery, transfer gallery. Um, but she called it this multi-tentacled beast. And it was really exciting um, to use several different technologies, but there were always parameters. We started from this original source text and responded to each other first, but then we also built an app um, that tweets out poems, and so people can redact the poems that are actually, in fact, redactions from this original source text and alter the images, and then that's all getting aggregated and will go into an iBook. And that was really an exciting project to work on because of the um, generative nature of it and how that even though there's a through line to um, each of the works, they also are autonomous in a sense because of the media through which they're expressed. So. Um, I, I think uh, there's this interesting thing that's happening now where, I mean at first, you know, when, when media first are artists start taking them up, yeah, there is this sort of demo culture, you know, of like what can it do? But now I think that there's um, also uh, a nostalgia for uh, like older versions of digital media, you know, older software, you know, and this is something that is, you know, in Corey's work, I'm not sure if you would see it as, if you see it as nostalgia or something else, but it just, to me, you know, it looks like, you know, this sort of looking back, you know, at, at you know, earlier versions of coding and, and earlier technologies and kind of trying to, you know, reclaim them and pull them into the present somehow. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure nostalgia is the right word. Uh, for me, it was always important to um, use things, uh, well, Technology is driven by a kind of like hyper capitalism, right? And so things just go <laughs> off the shelf so quickly. And it's just a really fertile ground because after three years, the prices drop and it's basically trash. And, and that's just, I always found a really easy area to work in because people aren't really using the things anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you're, mm -hmm. the pressure of, of the 
the, the whatever the technology is as a real cultural force has been removed because it's not really in circulation anymore. And so, um, you know, n nostalgia kind of implies a sickness for the past, but uh, I, I always thought of it, I mean, it's like, is the stuff is kind of junk, you know. Uh, digital dumpster diving. Digital dumpster, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, digital dumpster diving or, um, or whatever, you know. And just because technology moves so fast, it's, it's pretty easy to work that way with technology because it's just, it's just the pace is so ridiculous. It's like obscene. I'm curious. I'm curious if you think of the work that's created with this sort of junk as equally disposable? Uh, well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends. I mean, the work becomes artwork, right? And, uh, and uh, I ideally the artwork kind of um, takes all that situation into account and, and is, is kind of vital, it is vital to its, its, its being as a thing. Does that make sense? And so uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can answer that because once we get into the realm of artwork, things become kind of um, amorphous, right? Because artwork is something that we can't really put, a, can't really figure out. You know what I mean? How much of the artwork is about the process rather than the finished piece? I, I've seen a lot of artworks in the digital realm come onto you know the internet and not necessarily have a physical form. Um, and I know, Corey, your process is very important to the way that you create your artwork. So um, what part does the process have in the creation, in the fact that it becomes an artwork then? Uh, I guess case by case scenario, you know what I mean? Each work is different depending on whether it's process based or, and uh, yeah, and also I wouldn't really put a hierarchy on what form it ends up in as a website or whatever, you know, it's all pretty cool. Maybe somebody out. I mean, I don't know what would be all you all would think about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely. My, in my own work, yeah, case case by case basis as well. I would say. I mean, m my recent work deals a lot with um, like basically appropriating algorithms and seeing what they put out. So that's mostly about the process, and I have no idea what the form is going to be. Um, so so more recently, I'd, I'd say more 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 process based. Um, but there's always the problem of finding a form and communicating, you know, what what it is that's that's happening or what's going on. So, yeah. do you feel like the work is best shown in a certain form? Like, so you're taking these images from, you know, Google Earth, um, and then when you put them in a gallery, does that feel alien to you? Um, no, I think it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that was actually my next question. Uh, so, yeah. thanks, Julia. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's digital it's, technology. Yeah, it's like a really good demonstration of this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis as well. I mean, I think sometimes the decision is really easy, um, and the, um, the images or the, the outputs lend themselves to, to uh, a particular outcome. In the case of the iconoclashes, they were photographs to begin with, distributed digitally, sort of merged together digitally, and so just made sense that they would end up as framed photographs again. Um, the one that I've done probably the most different things with is this, the Google Earth project again. Um, there's like a, there's a video, there's actual little postcards, there's prints, there's these droopy things on the wall. Um, so yeah, I'd say there, that's more of a struggle to play with different forms and figure out which one is right. Yeah. But do you think it's just, oh, do you think it's just one form that's right? Well, with that project, no. I right. mean, I like that project being that a bunch of different forms. Mutable. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah, I would say different contexts exerts different pressures on the work and, and activates different parts of it. Yeah. So, but it's, it's one of the cool things I have to say, like, uh, you have this kind of flexibility and when it enters a gallery, it's in, like institutional pressure exerted on it, but when it's online, like maybe your aunt might look at it. <laughs> and, and it's a real advantage, I think. Uh, it's a real advantage of working this way. I mean, it's, well, I think, one of the best, one of the best parts. Yeah, the fact that it's online is like the democratization of art. Um, 
our collection is online here at the Met. Many museums are moving towards digitizing their collections. And then artists are digitizing their own artworks and putting them up on their own sites and through galleries and through their representation. So they're utilizing digital technology to not only create the works but display them as well. So there is that dichotomy between a gallery setting versus a, a physical gallery setting versus online. And how do you as artists envision people viewing your work and is do you want them to see the physical work more or is it what is what is your what are your thoughts on those two realms that we have existing now today? I have um, I actually have a book with me that I'm reading right now, The Physics of the Future. And there's one point he makes about comparing and contrasting high tech to high touch. And he talks about kind of the caveman principle that, you know, we've been on the planet for, I mean, as the human species for what, 200,000 years, I think, 40,000 years, we made the first mark on a cave. And um, there's still this driving principle that we need to you know hold events like this right and so we still need kind of the physical space to interact with people and I suppose to interact with objects so that's kind of the high touch but then there's the high tech and he gets really excited talking about holodecks for example and I'm like yeah I want a holodeck too you know I want people to see my art in a holodeck I want it to be a truly immersive environment but I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive I think that if anything our online lives today kind of indicate how porous all of this is. And that less and less, particularly with younger people, less people are drawing distinctions between IRL and URL. And you know, it's kind of like, it's all happening at the same time. It's this very porous fabric, so. Yeah. <laughs> how, so in, in light of that, how do you think that these artworks that are created today, the digital art is going to, digital art and digital technology are going to change the museum experience for the visitor? Um, well, I think that in it, it, the art will become more uh, connected to our devices. Uh, you know that, that we, we all, pretty much everyone, I'm sure everyone in this room, you know, always has a, a computer in their pocket, um, and so I think it's it's inevitable that these devices will start playing a, a role in terms of mediating our experience of the artworks. I mean, they already are because everybody walks around the museum photographing everything on the wall. Um, and th I think that's just gonna, that, that role is just gonna expand and that artists will start working with that, uh, with working with the devices, creating works that engage people's devices and, m you know, sort of make that part of the viewing experience. Um, you know, that's, I think that's just, you know, one, one of the ways that, that digital art and is going to ch change the experience of going to museums. Right, and we're also seeing a lot of projection-based art. Um, we have the William Kentridge Refusal of Time Upstairs, which is multi-channel projections. Um, it's analog art, but pr using digital technology for its display, and it wouldn't be possible without digital technology. So um, there's an example of a little analog, a piece of analog art that is still touched by digital. Um, and I think that's sort of what we started out talking about where sculpture, uh, video, photography, everything has been influenced by this technology and it's no longer its own classification. It's sort of blurred. Um, I was gonna say, I think it's also important to consider that like a lot of artists now will uh, make their work so it looks really sick and photograph like really good in photograph and so they're not even really like so that's a whole another situation that's happening right like it'll just be a sculpture but this the sculpture will make the sculpture basically so how it photographs you know and so this stuff is c kind of pouring into everything right and and the photograph is a documentation of a sculpture but in a way it's also kind of activated like so it's an actually active thing right and so i don't know there's a lot of cool stuff that i think's happening you know yeah on that note just a funny note i was actually trying to put contemporary art daily through the image merge algorithm to see if it could just create like automatically create contemporary art that's like <laughs> perfectly photographed in the with the like even fluorescent lighting 
<laughs> but yeah, no, I, I agree. And, but, and, and I think there's really interesting uh, projects that address that too. If it's like Artie Vierkrant's image objects where he, he always edits the documentation. Um, so no photographs of the sculptures or prints are released without him like using the clone stamp tool, which is really, yeah, it's problematizes that in a really interesting way. Yeah, it's a cool time to be alive. <laughs> Julia, I was going to ask you about your recent um, appointment as the director of the New Museum's Incubator for Digital Art and Technology. Um, I think this is a step in towards the digital direction for the museum field in general, and I was wondering where you stand at this crossroads right now where you're planning um, this process, this program that um, will hopefully encourage and influence the landscape of digital art? Where do you see it going? Um, wow, it's a big question. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that, you know, um, museums have been sort of experimenting with collecting and showing and supporting digital art for um, at least since 1968, um, I think, uh, which was when the first computer art show was. Um, so it's not entirely new. Um, I, the new museum has actually been supporting this kind of work throughout its history. Um, they had a media lounge in like 2000, and they've been one of the only institutions to have a continuous support of digital art uh, through its relationship with Rhizome. So um, I think it's, it's really exciting that they're starting this space uh, to support this type of practice in art, design, and technology. Um, the incubator, is focused less on incubating art that's going to be exhibited in the museum and more, I think, uh, addressing certain kind of cultural shifts that we're seeing in the way that creative practice is maybe becoming slightly more entrepreneurial. Um, and to me, I'm just looking at the way that my friends and the community that I'm surrounded with um, struggle to create the work that they want to make. Right, uh, a lot of people I know are, you know, going from grant to grant or residency to residency, or you know, they're teaching to support their practice, um, and that's all great. Um, and then other people are experimenting with sort of straddling this creative commercial divide, where they're maybe doing commercial uh, commissions to fund their creative practice and uh, using the two to inform one another and using the commercial work to allow them to kind of experiment with new tools or uh, kind of do a sort of R&D that maybe then feeds back into their creative work and you know, vice versa, the creative work pushes them into all kinds of weird experimental territory that then might uh, find its way back into uh, paid work. Um, and these are kind of new sort of creative economic models that I see a lot of people exploring. And that's kind of the thinking that informs the incubator. Um, how can we provide an institutional cultural framework to have these conversations, to uh, provide support for this uh, new breed of creatives who are leveraging these digital tools um, and, and help them build sustainable creative practices. So. Um, the incubator is, you know, a shared workspace, a community, um, but also a professional development program that uh, attempts to, you know, uh, try and answer these questions as a community. Inspiring the next generation of digital artists. <laughs> hopefully, I mean, supporting. I think supporting and inspiring. Hopefully, it just uh, <laughs> it. it bridges that gap a little bit too between the museums and the practitioners and uh, you know will create more opportunities for dialogue between the curatorial staff and the educational staff and the museum staff in general and the people who are working in the incubator and you know just I think having this community essentially as a new kind of artist in residence uh, working adjacent to the museum is a really exciting proposition and I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited too, and really happy for you. <laughs> um, so before I turn it over to audience questions and a couple questions from Twitter, um, I just wanted to close with what's next? 
um, to the artists, what's next, what are you thinking about, what technologies are you interested in, um, what do you think is next in the fabric of digital technology as it stands today and where it's going. So if anybody has, I'm, I'm throwing you a curveball here, so. <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. Um, or do you want to? What? No, you look like you're Let's go in order. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> My obsessive compulsive disorder is taking over. I was like, can we please go in order? <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. You're like okay. the restaurant, I always order last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, in terms of my own practice, if I kind of go down the laundry list, um, before digital art, you know, I went through photography, Xerox art, you know, Polaroid art, all of these things. And then since then, you know, 2D printing, 3D printing, AR, uh, animation, GIFs, you know, uh, there's just a list of different technologies that you use, uh, software, code, all of these things. But, you know, the, the primary tool is our minds, our brains. That's the tool, you know, and we haven't even reverse engineered the brain. So there's so much talk about the singularity and all of these different technologies, but I'm really excited about the ways that we will kind of um, understand our own brain and those methods, especially now when we have access to this collective conscious via technology in a way we never have before. And it's a really exciting time and, and ways to kind of explore that more um, interest me. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> All right, I don't understand. Oh, are we? Okay. I get <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a huge question. Um, I would say the thing I'm, I'm interested in uh, right now is, uh, well, in, in, in 1970, right, Harold Cohen developed this painting robot called Aaron. Um, and he, he, he wrote this brilliant essay that's called What is an Image? Because he didn't think that anything that the robot drew was actually an image, right? There's this idea that images um, are a form of communication, right? They embody a certain act of communication. And there's a real question of, uh, you know, the, the things that I show, these things that, that um, are, are they really images, right? Are they acts of communication or are they, what else are they? They're made by machines, are they data storage? Are they, who knows what else they are? And, and so you were talking about authorship and, and all those issues, right? And so, I, I don't know, I think what's, what I'm thinking about and what's in the near future is us being flooded with, whether it's bots that we chat with or spam bots or images that are m made for us by these algorithms. Um, yeah, how, how are we gonna deal with that? And what, what meaning are we gonna read into them? How are we going to negotiate this, that territory, I guess? Um, so my hope for the future as far as digital art and contemporary art are concerned is that they stop being disparate and I see that that's happening but for a really 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 long time probably too long I feel like digital art has been like the redheaded stepchild of the art world <laughs> and um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people about how, like, it, it really feels like there's, like, a palpable cultural shift, and some people are going to disagree with me. I know um, I've talked to a number of people in this room about how that's not the case. Hi, Marius. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that we're at a point now where people just get digital art more. They, you know, they get it because we do have computers in our pockets, and it's everywhere. It's such a pervasive part of our everyday lives that um, maybe the audience is ready for it now. And I think museums and galleries and collectors are starting to come around and be more willing to engage with it. I mean, we still you know, have some questions and have to cultivate some of the market. But the fact that this is happening here, I think to me, is an indicator that things are changing. So um, I'm really sort of optimistic that um, it'll sort of be, uh, you know, maybe the Met will start a, a media, you know, digital art collection. We're well, trying. Yeah. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're slowly, as I said, things move very Just slowly here. We're slowly moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, I guess as long as I'm talking. Uh, I will say that uh, the thing that interests me the most, um, you know, as, as I said, I'm coming from a photography uh, background, um, is, is cell phone photography. 
um, and how that has really, I think, been a, a sort of epochal change in photography, really one of the most important things to happen to the medium in its entire history um, because of, I mean, partly it's the sheer numbers of pictures being taken, um, but also uh, the ways that they're being uh, shared and looked at and, and um, sent around and recombined, you know, and, it, you know, it's just, it's it's a massive massive thing that I think is really 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 fascinating and you know I would love to deal with it in some way uh, you know at, here at the museum and I'm just trying to figure out how. Can can you also mention how the museum is sort of collect starting to collect and also starting to conserve works of art? I know we have a group in house that handles that. So if you want to maybe touch on that a oh, little bit. Well, yeah, we have this. Um, uh, uh, what do we call it? The time-based. The time-based <laughs> media. <laughs> time-based media working group, um, which is uh, looking at uh, the issues around uh, uh, collecting and uh, preserving uh, digital-based work, which which are things that that were you know that are very urgent um, that that we are trying to deal with in terms of you know how what do you do how do you migrate files from one platform to another how do you make sure that these things last for a thousand years you know how you know all of these you know what do you do with equipment and if something is designed for a particular piece of equipment you have to buy that what if they don't make it anymore you know there are all these big questions um, around you know the actual collection and display and conservation of this work that we're dealing with um, you know in both formal and informal ways. And as what I find interesting about that is that it's sort of in its fledgling state at this point, and it's a cross-departmental, interdepartmental collaboration. Um, I know some of my colleagues in digital media are working with curatorial and conservation in that group to put, you know, put together your minds and really think about how to care for the collection as it exists and as it can exist in the future. So that's, that's yeah. exciting for yeah. me. <laughs> and as the need arises, as the need increases, I feel like it's going to just grow. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I could start from there. Um, yeah, like one half, like what I've been doing is like just trying to take care of all the nonsense I made in the last 15 years. <laughs> like, uh, and so part of what I've been becoming lately is kind of a weird conservator of my own work and trying to deal with those issues. Uh, like willingly, because it's kind of like I'm working with old stuff anyway, so it's always been an interest of mine. Like this project here is like I'm republishing all my source code as zines <laughs> um, on 300-year archival inks and paper. That's good to hear. Um, so in a way, they are the kind of master copies of the work, uh, and I'll just sell them off my website or, or whatever. Uh, so that's like one thing, and then like for the new work, I'm just like making sculptures. I just like qu totally quit. <laughs> because it's just too much for me. I mean, I've been, my back hurts, like, I have carpal tunnel syndrome, so I really, seriously, I mean, it's like, I have like, I hurt myself being in front of a computer for the past 25 years, you know? All right, so I was if does anyone from the audience have a question? Um. <laughs> I'm Rafia. Um, how do we, in like 2014, distinguish between fine art and digital art, anyways? especially in terms of you know museum collections and online art? Where, where does that blur line? Where do we distinguish? I get you. That's a really good question because I we see a lot of art created by the masses or photos on Instagram or Tumblr feeds that have both artworks and like cr like draw like creative output that's just at a degree that it's never been before so um, what do you think Julia <laughs> um, to me uh, I think the the fine digital art um, is work that is both conceptually and technically strong um, and you know is is tackling some sort of uh, broader theme or idea. Um, so 
yes, you know, you can go on deviant art and find a whole bunch of stuff that would technically be classified as, as digital art, but, um, you know, it, it may not have the level of sophistication in terms of its conceptual rigor or, or technical uh, expertise that would satisfy my classifications of, of fine art. I have a question though, if, if it's on Tumblr and we're, we're talking about, I don't know if this is on, okay, um, and we're talking about, you know, the like economy, the attention economy, these kind of things, you know, um, that could be considered a work on Tumblr or a project on Tumblr could be considered a work of fine art even if it's not contextualized within a brick and mortar gallery space, right? It's not about the context, I didn't right, mention the context. Right, yeah, right. So, I mean, I was just bringing that up, you know, because DeviantArt, there are also kind of presumptions about online spaces too though, you know, in terms of where you're gonna find um, more critical work, I think, so. I think the reason I mentioned that one is because it specifically is like geared towards illustrators and graphic designers. I mean, fine art is that with which enters the archive of fine art. And so it can be anything, really. And it's just a trick of entering the archive of fine art. <laughs> I mean, that is the game of being an artist, is to like throw junk into the art pile <laughs> and, get, and, get, and convince people that it's art, right? That's what I would say, right? I guess the consensus determines in retrospect, but, what is art? And but also is, remember, yeah, the consensus art. is always being rewritten every day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're in a museum here, and when we walk around here, we see how the various art forms defined or explained the culture of a certain era. If we look at digital art, how do you think it defines our era in a way that, let's say, an analog art piece cannot do? So what are we contributing that maybe 100 years out, you can say, well, this is sort of the essence of our time, and only digital art could make that clear? It's a very speculative question, mm -hmm. but one that I think is important. Well, I think one thing um, works dealing with network culture. Um, I think that that's pretty significant, um, whether it's jogging or cloak, you know, in terms of some, you know, online works um, that are deal dealing with digital landfills, for example, or just the way that, you know, um, we are all networked and, and this new economy, attention economy, and how that the ubiquity model can actually serve an artist now. Um, it's no longer the only outcome is uh, scarcity. Um, and I think works that are um, in some way grappling with that will be works that indicate this particular time. I have a question from Twitter that sort of follows up on that notion of um, networked culture um, and the technology evolving. So this tweet is from Jeanette M. And the question is, what will art be like when computers become sentient and take over? Um, yeah, oh yeah, sure. Because um, I am, in fact, a sentient computer. Um, I know it's impossible to tell, but um, that's you know, that, that, that's the trick. No, I think uh, I, I um, as Julia said, I, I'm really interested in machine vision uh, also, um, and I think that um, you know that's uh, and and the idea of of you know looking at at how how machines see the world differently from the way that we see it. Um, and you know, this is one of the uh, issues that, that uh, you address in, in your work uh, as well, you know, that, that uh, you know, the, uh, so far, um, you know, a lot of the technology has uh, been mimetic and has, you know, imitated the way that, that we uh, perceive the world. But there are also, you know, ways that go beyond that and that, that shed light on the, but the limitations of our, of the human sensorium, and um, that, in a way, when e 
the computers don't even have to become sentient to start making art themselves. I mean, they're already doing it, and you know, artists are sort of just grabbing these things, appropriating these things that are already being created by computers and by networks and um, you know, by by uh, uh, codes. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's a it's a fer it's a fertile uh, territory. Yeah, and there is this relationship between the technology at where it exists now and the thought of where it can where it will evolve to in the future but now artists like Carla are and and Clement are calling out either glitches or um, in, in inadequacies in the technology maybe um, Carla your non facial recognition um, project sort of tricks the facial recognition software yeah right so i think it, a human mind might be able to examine the shortfalls of technology as it exists today, but where is it going? And it's an interesting question, Jeanette. Do you have questions? Yes. Um, I, I have a follow-up question to um, what Mia was just talking about, um, which is that I, th I think it would be interesting to hear a discussion of what originality means in a digital art context, we, we've, you just referred to a whole bunch of things that are basically found art or you know derivative in some way. Um, what, what's what's original art here? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's um, there's something I've been pondering. There's this historian who wrote this book, Medieval Modern, and he basically is um, kind of putting forth this supposition that the modern era, so 20th century, where we were already a product of the Industrial Revolution, we were already starting to mechanize things, Saul Witt was already giving a list of instructions, um, we were going through appropriation art, Michael Mandeberg from Sherry Levine to Michael Mandeberg to, you know, th these various appropriations and these questions of authorship. And um, he talks about or relates that to the medieval era, pre-Renaissance, pre-humanism, where um, there were all of these artisans. And so there was a totally different sense of attribution or what originality meant, you know? And, and it was much more collaborative in the medieval age. And then if we look to modernism, and then now we're looking to postmodernism into the digital age. And, and many people are talking about collaborations. They're talking about, um, you know, or, or engaging in projects where originality isn't really um, that essential. But of course it is still essential to the institutions, and, you know, and, and to taxonomies, and how do you categorize these things, and how do you actually set up um, a hierarchy or, or have criteria for which you determine what is fine art or not. And um, I'm asking questions, basically. I'm not <laughs> presenting any kind of resolution, but it was just interesting to me to think about kind of this full circle and about how that like we are in some way returning to a more medieval, era in the sense of the way that we are dealing with authorship and, and originality, you know. Um, so actually on that, Carla, my name is Carly, and I'm the photographer that took that photograph of Clement, uh -huh. right? <laughs> um, how would you kind of go about maybe explaining your, like our relationship as me being one of the people who helped make that image possible? That is such a good point. And, um, as I've been working on this project, every time I finish one, I always contact the person who is involved because all of these were given to me and he actually gave me that photo credit, yes. And, um, and so you'll be listed too, I'm listing everyone who was involved in the project unless they ask not to be listed, of course, if someone wants to rena remain anonymous, that's totally fine too. Um, but they're all appropriated. You know, I, I'm calling this portraiture in a sense, but it's 21st century portraiture. I didn't take the portraits. I asked someone to send me a selfie or a portrait someone else took of them and to give me the rights to then scramble it in some way. And so then it becomes part of this lineage, you know, and it's connected. So do you take any issue with this piece? <laughs> and I turned it back on its side, by the way, because I'm normally over, it's... <laughs> Speaking of that. Yeah. <laughs> Corey, I saw you turned on your mic. Did you oh, did turn it off? No, okay. I, Clement, I, did you I turned it off. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, Clement, did you have a response no, to that I, as well? Um, 
Well, not to this specific issue, although yeah, I sent the selfie, or not, not the selfie, the photo that you took. But he sent the credits, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. um, Small world. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> but I, no, but I did want to touch upon, yeah, the, the idea of originality t touched upon earlier. I'm, I'm obsessed with the, the idea of Cairo poetic images, and I'm probably even pronouncing that wrong. Uh, but it's, it's basically, there, there was a time when images or idols or sculptures, if a human had made them, they would lose all their, their, their power and their meaning, basically, right? So, so um, uh, you know, th the idea that, that, that Veronica's veil or the Shroud of Turin is manufactured by a human completely destroys that object. And those are just two examples, but there's, you know, that was art for probably much longer than the idea of authored art that we have today. So it's, it's just something to consider. I mean, I, you know, I think, what? Yeah. So as we're entering the matriarchy, you know, maybe authorship's gonna change in that way. That leads into our next Twitter question also, well, sort of. Uh, this is by at Pop Cult Pirate. Isn't all work uh, digital art now? And why use digital as a descriptor? We wouldn't say analog painting. So we sort of touched on that briefly, but I think we have a lot more to say about it always, so. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, just again, coming back to it, to, I, I agree, all, all art, you know, all work is digital work. Um, does painting that uses transfers, is that photo? Is that interesting to consider that as photo? Is uh, non-lens, you know, I'm thinking of Waleed Beshti's darkroom pieces, uh, are those not photographic because it doesn't use a lens? or does it have to do with what discourse it's placed into? So coming back to Corey's point, it's like, what junk pile can you get it in? And then, you know, the junk pile is all segregated in these little things, so you kind of have to pick which junk pile you're kind of throwing your junk in with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, um, Duchamp's thing was the artist has two jobs. One is to make the work, the other is to basically manipulate its its entry into the world. And that means, yeah, like deciding what pile you're gonna throw it in and m like basically engineering that. Anyway, but uh, yeah, sounds okay. That's not, I would maybe favor that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's complicated, let's say. Let's just say it's complicated. <laughs> Is that still a Facebook status or? I, I don't know. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I do. It, it seems like a lot of the conversation and the discourse about this is the fact that the work itself is intangible. And I, the first exposure I had to that idea was follow with drawings where he would give the instructions and he would actually not really make the work. And I'm just wondering whether or not I think a lot of artists um, reference Solowit as, you know, sort of a uh, forefather of this process-based practice. And um, I do think of it as a continuum, but maybe we should ask the artists as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I would see it as a, as a continuum, whether it's, it's Solowit and sort of procedural-based work or Fluxus mm -hmm. happenings, right, uh, having to do with, with, with uh, you know, um, becomes what, relational aesthetic, becomes whatever is post-relational aesthetic. So, so I think intangibility has been around for, for, for a while, uh, even just art and language. Mel Bachner, like all of the sort of 70s, did dealt with that quite a bit. And the so. dematerialized art object, Lucy Lepard, yeah. you know, I mean, th this has been part of a conversation or um, um, kind of a, a discourse for quite some time pre-digitally or pre-digital. But I think digital art is more tangible than it seems. I mean, at least from a museum perspective, you know, we have like storerooms full of, of heavy equipment that is needed to display this work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. and, and that takes up a lot of space and, and uh, you know, and money and, you know, that it's sort of, it, it's, you know, although, 
some aspects of the work are intangible. Other aspects, you know, are actually, you know, very, you know, physically present and and you know have to be dealt with, you know, in terms of storage and archiving and treatments and stuff like that. So. It, oh, can I add? Can I add something? Yeah. Which I would uh, to continue on what you were just saying. Uh, one way to maybe think of a, a lot of this stuff, or at least I've been trying lately. I'm not sure if it's if it's a good thesis is like performance, like these are instructions which are to be executed by machines, whether the machine is a projector or the machine is a computer or the machine is a blah, 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 right? And so a lot of, and it's helpful to think of it that way in terms of preservation as well because some of the machines might drop out and so then you ha they have to be performed by different machines and then it changes the look and blah, 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 blah. So I've been trying that out lately in my mind. Right, to see if you, how you would feel about having your work, you know, executed in a way that you hadn't yet envisioned? Or oh, no, just basically thinking of my, all my works that deal with software or uh, machines as mm -hmm. performance, oh, okay. as performative work. So you've chosen oh, that pile to yeah. throw your junk in? No, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gotten that far of describing myself as a performance artist, but, uh, but it's a possibility, let's say. Do you know what I mean? That could be cool, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm on performance art panels in the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, Clement's point about there being many options for t contemporary digital artists to decide where and what medium to place your art, your digital work, um, as if it's a print, if it's a sculpture, if it's a performative piece, if it's a piece of software on a machine that will eventually have to be translated to a different machine if it's a work on canvas um, that was dig digitally created, I think um, you have all those options available to you, so. A lot of times from one file, you know, it's one file that can be um, output in all of these different ways. You can get a 3D print, you can get an animation, you could get a digital drawing, a uh, digital print, and that's what's really exciting um, about what we're doing, the realm of possibilities. Okay, we have time for one more question, and we have someone in the back with her hand raised high. Hi. Um, Corey, I'm glad you just said that. We've been tossing around, my name's Claudia, I run Transfer Gallery with my partner, Jeremy, and we've been tossing around the idea of talking about this idea of digital art and the This one is right to you. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> well, go, go ahead. No, well, I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I don't, it, it's an interesting distinction, but um, I mean, yeah, coming back to, to Corey's idea of, of performance, I mean, I, I feel like that's dead on because especially like, I don't know, I really like that the JPEG compression thing that you wrote and there is something about, um, like that, yeah, that was like literally a performance because as it travels around the internet, it's performing itself. Yeah. Ugh, I, that sounded so <laughs> horrible what I just said. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Hor I'm sorry. That sounds so lame. Sorry. Just keep on going. <laughs> no, but what, what, what I like about thinking about it that way is that, is that, is that uh, you know, any image, like the, the JPEG compression, it's encoded as, as, you know, ones and zeros or ons and off. And every time we're seeing it on a screen, the screen is actually sort of regenerating it there. And then the minute you turn off the screen, it, it, it no longer exists as an image. It exists as a bunch of ones and zeros that's unintelligible to us. So, I don't know. I, yeah, I think that's, that works really well as a description of, of a lot of this, this type of work, that there's this machine performing it. We just don't, yeah. 
it's nice to think of it that way, I guess. Remember that MoMA piece where the guy was in the computer? Does anybody remember a real human interface? <laughs> oh, is that Douglas Davis? Was that no. Who was? No, it was a real. No, it was like it was in Paula's Talk to Me show. It was from like this Barcelona-based oh, interaction. That's yeah. This was was oh, oh. <laughs> I, I told her that was a segue, and it's not important. It just made no. me think of this piece where this guy is in a box, and it's called a, a real human interface. And so you have this guy who's getting email, and so you see this little person. It's kind of like the wizard in Wizard of Oz. He's behind the <laughs> curtain, you know. Pay no attention <laughs> to the man behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. That was a digression, completely. <laughs> and, and with that digression, we're going to close the panel at this <laughs> this time so that we have time to mingle and have a couple more drinks before we have to leave the room. So thank you all for coming. Um, your questions were excellent. So appreciate it.